Today, we're gonna get to see Baltimore PD put on their fighting trousers. Hi friends, welcome to today's badge cam lesson here at Active Self Protection, it's a doozy. I'm your host as always, John Carey. I'm your co-host, Mike Willover. Today's video comes to us from Charm City, Baltimore, Maryland. This is not a paid endorsement, but I am a brand ambassador for Heckler & Koch for a reason. HK firearms are incredibly high quality, and when it's time to step up out of the entry tier, they're the only ones I recommend. You carry a gun just in case. Shouldn't it be an HK just in case? This guy that the cops are chasing, they want for uh, warrants for felon in possession and drug use. He's done time for aggravated robbery and felon in possession of firearm. He's a boy scout. They've got a whole bunch of marked and unmarked cars after this guy. So the unmarked cars tell you this is probably a vice squad uh, takedown or something like that. He's gonna get a gun out and multiple guns with giggle switches out and start in on these guys. We've got surveillance with audio and badge cams. We got a lot to watch here. Let's listen in. The suspect fired 33 rounds out of his firearms at the officers, both out of that Glock with a giggle switch and from his rifle that also was full auto capable. Officers fired 40 rounds back at him and his problem was that they were better at gunfighting than him and he went and met his maker. No officers were harmed or any other member of the public. Charm City? Charm City. Baltimore was a crap hole. It is absolutely an absolute dump. There's like one little part, Inner Harbor, uh, if you're ever there, don't leave that part of Baltimore, whatever you do. That's, yeah. that's an active self-protection tip right there. Otherwise, you might uh, end up running into this guy. Come for the crab cakes. Stay because you got murdered. You know, Mike, our first clue here is when you got multiple cars full, uh, you know, unmarked cars full of like vice cops on your tail, uh, this means you're probably not a Boy Scout on your way to Bible study. And so uh, we should expect bad stuff to go down here. I used to uh, work in the East County of San Diego with a gang task force, the East County Regional Gang Task Force. Great, great bunch of cops. And I had this full size, the older style Dodge Durango, the big one. And we called it, we played jump out Durango. So we would be five, six, seven deep in that thing and roll into an area. It wouldn't be noticed by people. And you could kind of get the, uh, the jump on them, the element of surprise. But yeah, th these guys were after this guy specifically that day. And listen, I, I know I said this before, right? So these uh, third party kind of, you can order them, you know, from overseas, uh, full auto switches for Glock pistols. I mean, of course, 
you know, uh, the thing is, is people hear that, they hear that full auto fire and they go, oh no, this guy's got a full auto gun. In reality, if you understand what you're looking at here, him putting that giggle switch on that Glock with a you know, big drum mag on it means great. He could not hit his, both, his ha butt with both hands if you drew him a map right now. So the fact is that he's spraying and praying is, is good for you because you know he's not going to hit you probably, but you better put him down because he's spraying bullets off into the community. Absolutely. I'll tell you, I, I think you and I have both fired. My son's fired a full automatic uh, Glock 9mm. Uh, it's not, it's useless is what it is. Um, it's fun. You know, it's fun to do at a range when you can do it safely. But the odds that this guy ever practice with that you can't go to a public range and fire full auto they're gonna they're gonna call the police on you um so the odds that he's ever practiced with that gun are pretty slim maybe maybe a couple of bursts in the woods somewhere um not something these officers can actually probably have time to think through as they're going through this but for future reference here's your mental rep you hear full auto fire um don't be afraid it's probably less accurate than you know, it is definitely less accurate than just regular semi-auto fire however it does sound scary it is intimidating yeah i, I mean Obviously firing his G-lock with one hand, you know, not looking at sights or anything like that, already those bullets are going God knows where. But you add the full auto capability on it and it's scary, but it actually makes him less capable. Now he tosses the gun, probably because that, that uh, drum mag makes it malfunction, and now he grabs a rifle. And at several points here, you heard officers say, oh no, he has a rifle, and that made some kind of kind of head away and head to cover. Again, this is where I really think skill and emotional fitness comes into play because if you're highly skilled and this means you have to know it and you have objective measures of it, you recognize, dude, rifle or what? I'm better with my gun than you are with yours. And so I'm still ahead in this game. But if you don't know that for sure, then, then you can have some real serious reactions here. This is a great example of why it's so important for you to be confident in your marksmanship, obviously. You should be running your sidearm, your service pistol, as much as you can, put as many rounds through it as you can, do as much dry fire as you can, but also to maintain it. That confidence in knowing this is going to go bang when I want it to go bang because you've run it so much and you've maintained it properly. Um, cleaning cleaning's important, but not nearly as important to making sure it's lubricated properly so you don't get a double feed or a stovepipe or whatever. Um, and you mentioned the officer sort of going, oh, no, there's a rifle. I fully understand the feeling. Um, if I saw a rifle come out, it would definitely be a pucker factor because now this guy has a superior weapon. But the odds of him having superior marksmanship, in my mind, if this were me, are almost zero. I know I'm better with my gun than he is with his. Yep. Now we got multiples that are showing up here quick. Now let's think about the problems that they face. There's a whole bunch of them here, especially if you go watch the original. Our first officer here gets out of the driver's seat, starts to get after this guy. Now he does have a partner just to the left a little bit. I think he has some room in order to continue to be effective here. But I want you to recognize, he has to stand and deliver here. This is probably, he's got my estimate here, based on, on what we see, is about a 13 or 14 yard shot on this guy, and he hits. Now, listen, I'm not saying if you can do this on the square range that you can do it in the real world. I'm not saying that. I am saying if you can't do this on demand on a square range, you are surely not going to do it in the real world. But this officer here, you can hear, he's not panic firing. He's shooting at the speed that he can see his sights. Grip is the master, sights set the pace, trigger is the servant, and he gets hits at beyond what we would call typical distances. So, so listen, officers, your qual is not the standard you should shoot for. It should be excellence in your marksmanship. 100%. And I'll say this is, this is the intersection of force-on-force -force training and marksmanship training, which are two, two very different things. The marksmanship is obvious. You know, you go to the range, you do your best to, to make sure that your, your grip sights and trigger control, your breath, your stance, everything else are what they, where they need to be to deliver effective fire. The force on force, where you're using some sort of simunition or something similar, uh, is important to sort of get you used to the idea of violence, get you used to the idea of your heart's pumping, your adrenaline's going, and you still got to take that moment to stand tall and deliver this round. Unfortunately, the sim guns aren't accurate. They're not super accurate. So you can never fully recreate this in training, right? You're never going to get this exact intersection of two very different things, the marksmanship and the force on force. But if you do both of them enough, I think that's that's the combination to put yourself in a position to prevail in a situation like this. Yeah, and, and listen, Mike, I, I, I know some people are going to have a hard time with the last couple shots, okay? Some folks are going to have a hard time with the last couple shots. Quite frankly, given the... Um, the, the nature of what we're looking at here, the totality of the circumstances, dude's got, uh, you know, two full auto guns. He is, is looking to actively hunt the cops that are chasing him and play patty cake through cars at them. 
Um, I don't. I think that, hey, this guy here, we got to make sure that he's not moving. Now, of course, uh, Baltimore is who blurred this out, so I can't tell all of the, you know, movement or not movement. And, and eventually, of course, you got to stop. I will say as well that some of this is these cops are all shooting iron sighted pistols, which means they're probably focused on their front sight, which is what they're taught to do. So they're going to be late to understand when he stops moving and when he goes down because their focus isn't on the threat. And that's just kind of what training does. You know, for those who are who are going to be in the comments, and I totally understand if you're in the comment section going that last shot, especially bothered me because it seemed like overkill. It seemed like too much. Listen, you don't have, I don't have to be wrong for you to be right and vice versa. We can disagree on this sort of thing. Um, and I can, I can absolutely understand where someone would see that last shot and say, Hey, that was one too many. But like John said, the, the front sight focus is a real thing. Ask any officer who's, who worked, you know, in law enforcement prior to the last few years. I know there's cops who are starting now with dots and that's fantastic. But if you have been on an iron sighted gun forever, the front sight focus is how they teach you to shoot, which means your target is blurry which means it's not as easy to pick up movement. Um, I, I didn't love that last shot, just so you know, um, but I don't know what this officer saw. And like John said, this guy's actively trying to murder police officers. He he, he had no compunction. He, he had a mini North Hollywood shootout planned here, apparently. Yeah. And, and so, again, I, you know, did I love it? No. Is it criminal? No. I, I don't, I'm not really worried about it, quite frankly. Now, our next officer gets out. You see him kind of bound. That's awesome. And here we're going to see, I think, the very best shot he had, right? So this was the best shot any of these officers had, which was here about 10, 11 yards away. Um, guy's facing away from you, so he's not pointing a gun at you. We're in the lowest stress environment. We got to get hits here. I don't think they did get hits on him, but this is why we teach stand tall and deliver and shoot at the speed that you know you can get hits. And that takes a lot of training to do because... The threat just gets harder from here. Your first shot is almost always your best shot. We saw a not dissimilar situation, uh, that Houston freeway car accident video that came out not too long ago where they had some opportunities that were missed. However, I will say this, in the mind of a law enforcement officer, you are, no matter what's happening, you are always in the back of your head thinking, am I going to get fired? Am I going to get sued? Am I going to be cr criminally charged or something if I take this shot right now in a situation like this? And you have to, you have to know kind of where you're at in, in the scenario. At this point, he has now shot at police officers more than once. He has been ordered to drop, ordered to stop, or to do all these things, and he has not complied with any of them. And now you see this, this freeze grab, he's facing away from you. And this cop's almost certainly asking himself, well, you know, he's not waving a gun at me right now. He's not facing me right now. Can I shoot? The answer is yes, you can. You should be giving verbal commands regardless of what you think he's going to do, just to A, cover yourself in liability and B, keep yourself breathing. But I, I, I think it's important to understand that this person needs to be stopped because at any moment, a private citizen could walk out onto the street and be in the middle of this thing. Uh, and I think you could infer from his previous actions, he has no intention of surrendering. Yeah, totally true. And also now when our officer sees him pull out a rifle and he sees, oh no, he has a rifle, he immediately turns around and starts looking for cover. Hey, listen, I think that is an option. I think that's one way to go, but you do see a difference here between some officers who are moving forward and some officers who are looking to retreat here. And, and I, I would say, given the nature of what we're doing here, that the attitude that says I'm the hunter, not the rabbit, is going to end the threat in this case and in most cases, rather than going and finding cover. Yeah, I agree. I'm not, we're not throwing any shade at this officer. I fully understand what it, what it must feel like to realize that this person's full at pulling out some sort of, you know, 7.62 rifle and you're shooting back with 9mm. Um, but as John said, uh, be the hunter, not the rabbit is, is what should be going through your mind because you can go and hide behind this car um, and he's just going to continue to do what he's doing and potentially have a, you know, a 12 hour long drawn out SWAT standoff. We can end this now. And I think if you look at the other officers doing what they're doing, that became quickly became contagious. We like to say that if you're at a chaotic scene and nobody's in charge, I don't care if you're the rookie officer, you assume control and say, okay, this is what we're doing until somebody else with more experience takes over. And the contagiousness of their determination to press on, you can see here, he only, he only did this for a moment. He's like, okay, well, they're moving, so I guess I'll move too. And I think that's, you know, really wise. And they come in here, he does a good job averting his muzzle, good job getting, you know, to these guys. Now, let's think about our next officer here. Oh, boy, we got a couple of interesting bits here because he's got uh, a fellow officer way down range and awful close to his line of interest there and his line of sight. So he's firing here. You can see the, the uh, ejection of a case just starting out of his gun. 
And, and I gotta tell you, Mike, this one made my butthole pucker a little bit because of the priority of fire problem. Priority of fire is a real thing. And look, this is a chaotic scene. They're being shot at. They've just been shot at. There's been, you know, a high speed pursuit. So I understand that there's a big mental load here right now, but you just got to remember, let this be your mental rep. You just got to remember that there's an officer way ahead of you, that far ahead of you and that close to being in the line of your fire. You just got to let him handle it. Um, and if you're not confident, if you know that, for example, if you know that officer is a terrible shot or whatever, um, put yourself in a better position to prevail, move, get up next to him, flank, you know, um, flank the uh, bad guy from the right or whatever you can do to get yourself out of this position. But this is a terrible place to 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 pull the trigger. And, and understandable, right? Because we get tunnel vision. We get, uh, you know, visual exclusion where you may not see it, which is why you practice not just only focusing on that threat, but also widening your field of view while you do that. And you got to do that in training, do that in force on force reps. So now I, I notice our officer has a malfunction here and I want to notice he deleted the tap. And I know I'm going against dogma here and that this is well-established dogma, but the reality is, is if you know your firearm well and administratively you've already checked that your magazine is fully inserted, the tap is irrelevant, uh, okay? And, and it clears this malfunction, no problem. And we see it again and again when officers and private citizens too are working at the speed of necessity, at the speed of saving their own life rather than at the speed of training, they tend to delete the tap and it works just fine, which is why I'm not dogmatic about the tap. He's gonna do one a little bit later that wasn't necessary. But I, I think that uh, sometimes we do this stuff that's kind of outdated and outmoded and we don't need to. Yeah, the, the, the tap, if you look at a, a typical range on a law enforcement range day, uh, I was an instructor for a number of years. It, it, as this is anecdotal, right? I don't have hard statistics, but I'd say it's probably 25, 75, 25 percent of people when they encounter a malfunction at a timed drill on the range it is again approximate. Uh, they tap and then rack and then to proceed to solve the problem, however it needs to be solved. The other 75 percent go immediately to rack and never tap. And I would say, I don't remember a time when that didn't solve the problem unless there was a catastrophic failure um, and they had to rip, you know, and insert a new magazine, do all that sort of thing. So I'm not going to say don't tap, right? If it makes you feel better, if you think you can do it quickly enough to get back into an actual gunfight, knock yourself out. It's your gunfight, not mine. Uh, but I think, I think the tap is a bit antiquated at this point. And I think it should be drilled into officers' heads that that may be necessary but the, uh, the, the, the frequency of the magazine falling out of that being the issue is just so vanishingly rare. Yeah, that came from the Gen 1 Glock 17 that the magazines weren't drop free is what that was. And you could have one kind of hanging half out. Whereas in a modern gun, they'll almost always drop free, right? So, okay, fine. Now he's going to get after this guy and get into the fight and keep going. Now, I want to notice here that time he did tap the base plate, right? Why? Because his magazine was empty, but his grip made it such that the magazine didn't lock to the rear. Now... I'm not, a, I don't have a problem with this at all, right? So in somebody here who clearly knows what they're doing, um, I will tell you that on my gun, I can never get the magazine, to, the slide to lock to the rear when my magazine is empty because of the way that I grip the gun. And, and frankly, as long as you know that's coming, no big deal. Uh, and so sometimes we make a really big deal out of this about making people adjust their grip for slide lock problems. But notice that his, his fight is over at this point. So it's not really a problem other than kind of the what if scenarios. Yeah, If you've shot enough, you shot the weapon, you're, you're issued enough or whatever gun you're using, you know, on the job. This goes back to that confidence in the, in, in the gun, confidence in, in its, uh, its function and the fact that, you know, it's going to work every time. Uh, if you shot your gun enough, you know already if it tends to you know lock back or not lock back when the gun runs dry, and there is a distinct feeling when you shoot that last round. Um, you, you uh, it's tough to say how I know this. You can just sort of tell that you're out. One more one more empty trigger pull uh, will definitely let you know in the in the event that you haven't figured it out yet. And you know the, it's it's a half a second slowdown if it doesn't lock back to the rear it's preferable that it does but if it doesn't it's not the end of the world just get back in the fight yep and and now watch watch what goes down here another uh training dogma we're going to catch here is the fact that he's going to realize his gun is empty reload it now watch how he gets the gun back in battery he goes oh no i'm empty there goes a new magazine in the gun and he uses his slide stop lever with his thumb to get the magazine or to get the slide back down once he's inserted a magazine worked perfectly, flawlessly, right? So just like your trigger finger is a fine motor skill, this is a fine motor skill. Those can work just fine in, in a uh, gunfight as long as you've practiced it, as long as you know what you're doing. He does know what he's doing here. Obviously, clearly the guy's been around the block a few times, done a little bit of, of handgun training. 
And so I don't have a problem with it. We still find some places that have a big problem, but in this case work really, really well in a real gunfight to help this officer win. So these are training dogmas that I think we should really soften on. Yeah. And you got to understand that a lot of the stuff that military and law enforcement training, a lot of the dogmas that are out there, a lot of the things that are absolutes that are out there are a result of the fact that law enforcement agencies and military branches of the military are made up by the general population. And you have varying degrees of hand strength, you know, general strength, ability, intelligence. And so you have to train people to, unfortunately, to that lowest common denominator. I, I've never met a cop on the range who couldn't just use their slide release to get this done. Uh, it's a lot faster and a lot more efficient in my opinion. And it's not a big, super duper precision fine motor skill. It's, it's kind of, I, I think it's in between fine and gross, frankly, to bring your thumb up and do this. It's not a big deal. At the end of the day, John, oh, go ahead, John. I, I really think, man, you know, so all I'm saying is, is that if we train it, it works fine, right? And, and so whichever one is better for you, rock and roll. You want to power stroke it, you want to slingshot it, I don't care works just fine in real fights. I think that the bigger thing is here, this officer was in the fight, getting after this guy and making sure that he was down, making sure that the threat was ended. This was a very, very serious threat. I'm glad there were some meat-eating crime fighters around to protect their entire community and cover their asp.